Us donem la benvinguda a Caixa Fòrum Macaia. De seguida començarà l'activitat. Si us plau, comproveu que teniu els telèfons mòbils apagats. Moltes gràcies. Les damos la bienvenida a Caixa Fòrum Macaia. En breves momentos començarà l'activitat. Por favor, comproven que sus teléfonos mòbils estan apagados. Moltes gràcies. Bé, molt bona tarda. Buenas tardes. Eh, me complace mucho darle la bienvenida a la última sesión del ciclo que iniciamos a mediados de septiembre con el Instituto Europeo de la Mediterránea acerca del de, eh, el cambio climático en el Mediterráneo. Ustedes lo han ido siguiendo a lo largo de estos meses y hoy culminamos este ciclo con la sexta, con la última sesión, con un, un grafismo muy espectacular y muy atractivo pero que esconde cosas mucho más complejas de las que actualmente eh, nos amenazan en el Mediterráneo, a la vez que tenemos oportunidades que están a nuestro alcance si decidimos aprovecharlas. Bueno, hoy serán los temas que se discutirán en la sesión eh, pertinente y quiero agradecer simplemente el, eh, a los ponentes su presencia, a la moderadora eh, su función, y además veo que se ha puesto en el lugar adecuado para moderar a diestra y a siniestra. O sea, muchas gracias y a todos ustedes le agradezco su presencia. Gracias. So now I'm going to switch to English. And um, so this is a pleasure. Thank you very much to um, all the organizers for uh, not only organizing this dialogue today, but organizing all the series of dialogues about a topic that uh, sadly, it's a very important topic in the world, but especially in the Mediterranean, because it's a hotspot for climate change. So here today with me, we have uh, Natalie Hilmi and Jason Hall Spencer, and they're going to talk to us about fisheries, fisheries in the Mediterranean. And this is especially relevant because, well, the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, it's embedded in our culture, in our Mediterranean culture. The sea is what unifies us all, but also fishing is what uh, we've been doing for centuries. And also it was the way that we had centuries ago to get to know what is in the Mediterranean Sea. So nowadays, it's not only about knowledge and food systems is one of the main topics uh, when we talk about, about fisheries and also a very important topic in the context of this last COP28. So I'm going to introduce both speakers. So they're... You know, their bios are impressive. So I'm just going to say one thing and I'm going to let them introduce themselves in case they want to add something else. So Natalie is an expert in macroeconomy and international finances. And in 2010, she started working at the Scientific Center in Monaco. I don't know, Natalie, if you want to add something else to this? <laughs> Maybe I can add that. I'm also an IPCC lead author for the special report on the ocean and the cryosphere. 
and the main report, the AR6 in working group too. Thank you. And Jason is a professor in marine biology, which I love because I'm also a marine biologist in the University of Plymouth in the UK, also in the University of Tsukuba. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly in Japan and an adjunct professor at the University of Chiamen in China. So do you want to add something else to all of this impressive CV? Yes, yeah, sure. Well, I'm, I'm a marine biologist and I've done nothing else all my life. I fell in love with it when I was a, a boy. And um, I've managed to make a career out of it. But one thing I do know is the Mediterranean is changing and it's changing fast because I've been coming here for decades now. I'm getting old and I've seen big changes and I see that the fact that there are problems down, that are happening now that we need to address. So it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about it. So I think that between the two of them, we are going to get a really wide range of knowledge around what is happening in the Mediterranean in the context of climate change. I also know that they have presentations. So I'm going to let Natalie start. And with your presentation, we are going to just sit over there. So it's easier for you to present in case you want to use the... I better take this. Yeah. She's going to do the presentation in French. Bonsoir à tous et merci d'être là. Merci aux organisateurs pour cette réunion aujourd'hui. Je vais utiliser les, les résultats du rapport du GIEC et plus particulièrement le dernier rapport de synthèse qui a donc fait la synthèse de, des six rapports qui ont été lus pendant toute la durée du cycle 6. Euh, donc ce qu'on peut constater, c'est que euh, ce, les, 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 les les courants actuels que nous, nous voyons ne sont pas soutenables. Le monde actuel n'est pas équitable. Donc, regardez, nous sommes déjà à 1,1 degré Celsius au-delà de, des aires pré-industrielles, ce qui est inquiétant. Du coup, on se retrouve avec des concentrations de CO2 qui sont très importantes, le niveau de la mer qui monte, la glace qui fond en Arctique, mais aussi en Antarctique, les glaciers qui, se, qui reculent. Et tout cela, c'est tout ce qu'on a fait jusqu'à présent n'est pas suffisant, en fait, pour résoudre le problème du changement climatique. Donc, ce qu'il faudrait faire, c'est trouver, en plus de l'atténuation, la, donc réduire nos émissions de CO2, il faut, il faut que les populations puissent s'adapter. Euh, ici, nous voyons que chaque incrément de, de changement climatique va impliquer des gros changements puisque nous avons déjà des, des choses qui sont visibles, comme une chaleur extrême, euh, des, des pluies qui, qui sont de plus en plus fréquentes et intenses, la sécheresse, euh, les feux de forêt, euh, l'océan qui s'acidifie, qui devient de plus en plus chaud et qui perd son oxygène. Si on regarde, je pense que ces cartes sont très claires, pour montrer les changements à 1,5 degrés Celsius, 2 degrés Celsius et 4 degrés Celsius, le monde est de plus en plus rouge, donc de plus en plus catastrophique. Donc la science, les avancées scientifiques ont résulté dans, un, dans une meilleure compréhension de ce que sera notre futur et nos choix actuels ben, vont être impactés le futur. Donc il faut agir maintenant avant qu'il ne soit trop tard. Euh, en fait, les pertes et les préjudices sont déjà là. Ça fait partie de notre futur. Les écosystèmes sont déjà euh, en danger et les populations sont déjà euh, vraiment euh, très vulnérables face à ce changement climatique. Et euh, le, le, en, ce qui est malheureux, c'est que ce changement climatique est projeté, projeté d'être encore plus grave dans le futur. Donc, euh, pour l'instant, on n'est pas du tout sur la bonne voie. Regardez par exemple ici la perte de la biodiversité avec 1,5 degrés Celsius et 3 degrés Celsius. La différence est déjà énorme. Je vais utiliser maintenant le rapport spécial sur l'océan et la cryosphère. Euh, donc, euh, concernant l'océan et la vie marine, on sait déjà que l'océan a déjà pris plus de 90% de la chaleur marine en excédent. Euh, cela a causé son acidification, il est de plus en plus chaud euh, et puis en plus euh, il est euh, 
euh, il, de, il devient de plus en plus, euh, il manque de plus en plus d'oxygène et de nutrients pour les pêches. Et nous, nous allons voir l'impact ensuite. Ce qui fait que les populations de poissons vont bouger, la distribution de ces poissons vont bouger, ils vont migrer, ils vont aller chercher là où il y a de meilleures températures, de meilleurs nutriments. Et cela va nous causer des risques à nous en tant qu'humains pour notre santé et pour notre sécurité alimentaire. Ce n'est pas uniquement les populations pauvres, mais c'est vraiment tous les humains vont être impactés. Alors, il faudrait faire attention à la pollution, il faudrait mieux gérer nos pêches et euh, faire des aires marines pro protégées. Euh, on a l'accord le, le, euh, de Cumine Montréal qui a dit qu'il faut 30% d'aires marines protégées, euh, enfin, en, tout cas, en tout cas d'ici 2030. Donc voilà. Euh, je vais m'appuyer maintenant sur euh, mon dernier article euh, où j'ai étudié l'impact du changement climatique sur les pêches en Méditerranée. Alors pour cela, euh, nous avons identifié euh, les stocks de poissons, mais aussi les pays, puisque je suis macroéconomiste, donc je me suis intéressée aux pays de la Méditerranée pour voir quels étaient les pays les plus vulnérables quand les poissons vont bouger. Et pour cela, nous avons divisé avec mes co-auteurs euh, la Méditerranée en trois grandes zones. On a la zone du nord, que vous voyez en rose, qui représente les pays européens. À l'est, nous avons donc les, les pays comme la Turquie, la Syrie, le Liban, Israël, la Palestine et Chypre. Et nous avons les pays du sud de la Méditerranée, qui est en fait l'Afrique du Nord. Euh, nous avons étudié, des, les poissons que nous avons étudiés en fait, sont, ont été sélectionnés euh, parce que c'était les poissons qu'on capturait le plus, c'est les poissons qui ont une forte valeur commerciale. Donc on n'a pas voulu regarder les poissons qui étaient les plus impactés par hasard, c'était vraiment celles que, qui avaient une valeur économique. Alors pour cela, nous avons utilisé un indice de vulnérabilité euh, qui, qui comprend des, euh, des indicateurs euh, en biologie, mais aussi en, en économie, comme vous pouvez voir ici. Et pour cela, on a vu que les pays les plus sensibles étaient justement les pays les plus pauvres de la Méditerranée. Si on regarde, c'est surtout les pays d'Afrique du Nord qui sont les plus impactés. Et si on regarde leur capacité d'adaptation, on voit une fois de plus que ce sont les pays d'Afrique du Nord qui ont la, la capacité d'adaptation la plus faible. Alors, c'est un petit peu évident, puisque quand on étudie leur vulnérabilité économique, ce sont des pays qui s'appuient beaucoup sur les pêches pour leur subsistance mais pour, et pour leurs revenus. Euh, non seulement ils veulent s'en nourrir pour leur sécurité alimentaire, mais ils veulent aussi les exporter. Donc quand ces poissons vont se diriger vers le nord, ils vont perdre ces poissons. Euh, et c'est donc euh, toute une vulnérabilité qui va se rajouter. Alors ce sont des pays qui sont déjà impactés par des problèmes d'eau, par des problèmes de, de, de changement climatique beaucoup plus importants que l'Europe, qui a une capacité d'adaptation, on l'a vu dans, le, dans la diapositive précédente, plus importante. Là, ce sont vraiment une, une, une vraie question de justice climatique qui se pose en fait. Donc en conclusion, ce qu'on peut voir dans cet article, c'est que euh, les espèces de poissons commerciales vont se diriger de plus en plus vers le nord. C'est-à-dire que les pays du sud de la Méditerranée vont perdre ces poissons, vont perdre les revenus qui vont avec, et vont surtout perdre une sécurité alimentaire, puisque beaucoup s'en servent juste pour se nourrir. Donc ce qu'il faudrait faire, c'est mieux gérer ces pêches, cette gestion euh, de, de ressources, et puis, il faudrait une, une gouvernance plus collaborative entre les pays pour cela. La Méditerranée est un espace fermé, c'est un bassin qui est déjà clos. Si les pays ne collaborent pas entre eux pour essayer de résoudre le problème du changement climatique et d'autres stress comme la pollution, on n'arrivera pas, il faut vraiment le faire ensemble. Donc notre travail, ça a été vraiment une collaboration entre les sciences et l'économie. Euh, parmi les co-auteurs, nous avons vraiment des, des, des sciences naturelles, des gens qui sont comme des biologistes, des chimistes, des physiciens, et puis des, des économistes. Et, euh, et, et donc, euh, c'est pour ça que quand on a mis ensemble euh, ces, ces compétences, 
on a vu qu'on pouvait vraiment avoir des stratégies euh, de gestion plus adaptatives dans la Méditerranée. Donc, on peut aider les décideurs politiques et les parties prenantes à comprendre les problèmes en Méditerranée, autant d'un point de vue scientifique qu'économique. Et il faudrait aussi qu'on arrive à plus penser en prédiction. Et c'est pour ça que nous avons dans cet article un modèle. Par contre, pour bien euh, tout intégrer dans notre modèle, nous avons constaté qu'il nous manque encore des données. Donc la recherche est encore à faire, ce n'est pas fini, il y a encore beaucoup à faire et je vous remercie pour votre attention. Thank you Nathalie. So what we are going to do now because I, we think that is better for like the discussion is that Jason is going to present now his presentation and then the three of us are going to sit there and we are going to ask all the questions including your questions if you have any. Okay, that's so good. just this one. <laughs> Okay, good evening everyone. What? So, as you know, I'm from the University of Plymouth in the UK, but I also have um, a job at the University of Scuba in Japan, uh, which might seem strange, but it's because I started working in the Mediterranean on carbon dioxide seeps near underwater volcanoes uh, to see what the effects of increasing CO2 would be on fisheries, which animals are going to survive as carbon dioxide levels increase. And there are places around Italy and around Greece and around Spain, where there are volcanoes with CO2 bubbling up to the seafloor, and you can see which animals can survive, which fish, which mollusks can survive. And so I'm doing this work um, now again in Japan because it's uh, it also has underwater volcanoes. So that's the that's that's the Japanese link. Okay, so this slide backs up what Natalie was saying. Really, that it's getting real. It's getting uh, obvious. Even if you used to think that global warming wasn't happening, um, you can tell the water, or, you know, there's a lack of water in Barcelona. I was um, in Tunisia this summer and it was unbearable because the electricity system wasn't able to cope with the air conditioning that was required to keep us comfortable and it broke. So inside the apartments, it was more than 40 degrees centigrade. And the poor people in the street, obviously some of them were dying because of that. So since 1982, this graph is from, it's showing that all of the Mediterranean has warmed up. Okay, It's not a localized problem for Barcelona, it's the entire um, basin. And this is a rate of warming that's faster than is expected, and it's faster than is occurring in most other parts of the world. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk to you about how that's affecting the, um, the fauna uh, of, of the sea. Okay, there's these, these two um, species of crab, one of which is the American blue crab, the other one is the Indo-Pacific blue crab. Now, both of these are warm water species, and they're spreading really quickly in the Mediterranean now. They don't belong here, they're not native to the region. Um, the American blue crab obviously comes from the Atlantic coastline of, um, of the USA, Chesapeake Bay area, um, and the Indo-Pacific blue crab occurs throughout the Indo-Pacific, but it also occurs in the Red Sea. Now, they're both coming in. So this is now showing you the recent spread of the American blue crab. You can see it's pretty much everywhere, all up the coast of Spain, throughout the uh, throughout Greece and so on, okay? And it was introduced through ballast water. So when a ship uh, needs to balance itself, when it offloads the cargo, it takes on water. And in that water, it would have taken some juveniles of blue crab and released it, perhaps in Naples, who knows where, but it spread through the Mediterranean. Whereas the Indo-Pacific blue crab has actually come through the Suez Canal. So you can see it's now very, very common uh, in Tunisia. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if you start getting it along the coast of Spain very soon, because the waters around us are warming so quickly. The, um, the, the graphs are showing you where it occurs left or right, or north and south in the in the Mediterranean today, but you can see it's it it is spreading. Now, with the help of the Food and Agricultural Organization, which is based in Rome, 
they realized that the Tunisian fishermen were losing their livelihoods because these crabs devastate the seabed habitats and eat the fish types they need for their fisheries. So they have helped encourage investment from Asian countries like Korea to set up processing factories to develop a fishery for these two types of crab. Both of them are very aggressive. Both of them are highly opportunistic. Both feed on native species and impact local fishermen. And they've both got planktonic larvae, which do better when the water is warmer. They lay more eggs and they spread further. There's greater survival as the ocean warms. And so this is an ongoing problem. And I don't have an answer for this, but the Italians who have got fisheries that are based on the Vongole are really nervous about having a fishery supported by the FAO on their doorstep in Tunisia. Tunisia and Sicily are this close and encouraging fishermen to um, use this species in a way that's sustainable. So instead of trying to collapse the stocks, they're trying to build the stocks of this invasive species could cause enormous problems for people who've got in industries based um, on growing these clams. I know you do this in Spain as well. So my main topic of being here is about these lionfish because I've been involved with a European project looking at their spread um, in the Mediterranean. And before I forget the key points, this slide goes through um, them one by one. So the report says target lionfish quickly. If you want to deal with this problem, deal with them quickly. Rapidly develop opportunities for their commercial use. Change the law, because at the moment you cannot, you're not allowed to use scuba equipment to catch these fish. So the law needs to change in Spain and other countries. Create a supply chain. So there's no point in a fisherman landing a fish if it can't get to the supermarkets. So there needs to be a chain, a business chain. Get people interested, um, give them opportunities to see and eat uh, these organisms and take, a, a, take part in activities to manage them. Monitor them at sentinel locations, so places where you think they're going to spread. I'm worried about the gap between Tunisia and Sicily, because that's a bottleneck. If they start coming through fast, you're going to get them in Barcelona. Um, put them on the agenda for regional cooperation. It's no, no point in one country like Cyprus, for example, having a very good biosecurity program directed at reducing lionfish if their neighbours in Turkey or mainland Greece aren't involved. And then probably the most important for me is addressing the biosecurity problem in the Suez Canal. Because we know that's the route through which many, 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 I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of species are coming through. It's like cutting an artery that joins the two ocean basins between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And it's radically changing um, the biology of this region, exacerbated by warming, which encourages tropical and warm species. So this is disrupting ecosystems and impacting livelihoods and really does highlight the problem we now face. Now, the Suez Canal, don't get me wrong, is a fantastic way of reducing carbon dioxide emissions because instead of spending lots of money on diesel to go around Africa, you can trade in Barcelona with countries in the Middle East or the Far East through the canal, perfect. That's great. But these ships are getting bigger. And you might have seen on the news a few years ago, one of those huge ships got stuck, right? So they're making the canal wider. They're making it deeper to allow the big ships to come through. And unfortunately, what that's done is it's removed an area that had high salinity in the past. This high salinity area was a biosecurity block that stopped the movement of organisms. That disappeared in 2016. Now, what's really needed is to reinstate that high salinity region. We'll discuss, I hope, later what, how that could be done um, later on. But first of all, you can notice that there are big revenues generated by this canal, 13.5 billion um, generated in 2023. The cost of taking one ship through the canal and back is a million euros. So it's not inexpensive to go through the canal. And so there is money available to address this biosecurity problem. Could you, could somebody at the back there please play this video? Thank you. So this is um, what it looks like now in one of my favorite diving places in Cyprus. None of those fish were there in 27, 2016. 
They've bred, they've bred, they've bred, and now they're the most common fish underwater all around Cyprus, okay? You could see the numbers there, right? That doesn't look like the Mediterranean to me. I'm familiar with the fish that live here. They should not be here at all. So what to do about that? Well, lo removing them works quite well. So there's a very famous wreck in Cyprus called the Zenobia. And this is a team of people equipped with harpoons um, that were able to clean that wreck and remove the fish like you would remove rats from a barn. This is them underwater swimming around to catch the fish. You can see they're quite easy to catch, actually. They're not difficult organisms to, to target because the way they protect themselves is to stay absolutely still in the daytime and protect themselves with their, with, with their toxic spines. So they're easy to catch. What we're trying to do and what we've done with the project is to raise the price because to start with, fishermen and people thought they were worth nothing. They didn't know what to do with them. Uh, they were throwing them away. We're trying to raise the price because if you raise the price of this product, more people will catch them. And so by having events involving um, celebrity chefs, for example, or having fun barbecues on the beach with, with the television cameras, showing people that they are delicious and they are absolutely delicious to eat. You can make ceviche, you can barbecue them, you can make fancy dishes, and that raises the price. So now this is an example of from Cyprus showing him selling at 40 uh, euros per kilogram. That's a good price. Um, here's a Spanish slide. If you've got good eyesight, you can read some of the Spanish on this slide. But what it's saying is lessons learned about how to deal with this lionfish problem. Two red things at the bottom there are what you should not do. You shouldn't feed the lionfish on a stick to a shark or to a grouper or to another predator, because then that shark and the predator will start to attack divers. Um, and what you shouldn't do is have bounties. So for example, if the foundation here thought it was necessary to remove lionfish from the coast of Spain, I wouldn't recommend bounties to encourage people to catch them because that money runs out. Eventually that money runs out. What you would need to do instead is build social capital, create a group of people that want to do this for fun. And it is, it is really good fun if you're like me. I like catching fish, I like eating fish. This is a, a, a fun activity. There are other things that need to be happen as well. Coordination between countries, coordination within countries, a clear plan about what to do, um, and changing the law so that people can actually um, catch and, and deal with these fish. Um, obviously divers, can only go to a certain depth. And what's needed in deeper water where these fish live, they can live down to hundred meters, is some way of catching them from the deep. And this is our idea. So far we've caught zero fish using this <laughs> idea. Um, in Greece, they've caught two. So they're 200% better than us. But um, the idea is you have a, a, a plastic lattice fence that attracts the fish, you don't need bait. They, they like an object to be close to. And then you pull that up um, at the end of the day and catch the fish. It is working in Florida, so it can work. We just don't know how to do it properly ourselves yet. OK, so that's that's another way we can adapt the fisheries to cope with invasive species and climate change. OK, so with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, let's go there. So that was incredibly interesting, I have to say. I learned a ton. I have uh, a lot of notes. And I think that is fascinating how both of you mentioned the cooperation between countries and that this is not exclusively a scientific problem or just a problem that we can tackle from the science. You both mentioned uh, political issues like changing the law, but also economy, how to increase the price in the market of this fish or like, uh, and, and you, Natalie, also mentioned something um, very, very important, which is climate justice uh, and, and, and how uh, to 
face all of this problem with climate change and fisheries. So building up on that, I wanted to ask you, so since we know that climate change is affecting the fisheries and since we know that this is going to have an impact in the south that is different from the impact in the north, how are the implications, the macro, the, the socioeconomic implications of all of this, not only the effects of climate change in the fishery, but also like the difference between the effects in the south and the north? Mm, se continue en français. You can do whatever okay. you want. <laughs> <laughs> Just let me go for my... <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Alors, il y, a, il y a un problème de financement, en fait, parce que on sait que, déjà, à la COP27, on a eu ce fonds de loss and damage, le, le perte et préjudice. Donc, ce qui, ce qui se passe, c'est qu'en fait, la plupart de l'argent disponible pour lutter contre le changement climatique va vers l'atténuation. Or, les pays du Sud sont des pays où ils se sont pas assez développés, par définition, et en plus… Ils n'ont pas besoin de cet argent pour, ce, pour, pour l'atténuation seulement. Ils ont besoin surtout de l'argent pour l'adaptation. Or, il n'y a pas assez de financement pour l'adaptation. C'est pourquoi il y a une réelle, un réel combat entre les pays du Nord et du Sud, dans les COP notamment, parce que les pays du Sud réclament une certaine justice. C'est ce qu'on appelle une justice climatique où l'argent leur va pour pouvoir s'adapter aux changements qu'ils n'ont pas causés en réalité. Donc euh, le problème des pêches, c'est juste un aspect, mais le problème est beaucoup plus vaste que uniquement le, le, le problème du changement climatique. Wait, I'm sorry, I'm catching up. <laughs> That was uh that was very interesting. Thank you. And and then I wanted to ask Jason about like uh so um you were we were talking before when we were in in a room right next to us preparing for this and we were talking a little bit about um how when I have friends in Colombia that they have the same problem with lionfish and they are organizing some of these things that you were saying and and I said like that's great we can like create this uh content with chefs and then everybody's going to be eating lionfish and Jason was like yes but so I want to I want you to talk to them about this yes but which is like yes we increase the price of the lionfish in the market and yes this is uh this is a possible solution but it's also uh we have a double standard here right because like if we increase the price in the market then maybe we are also going to run into the the a problem that you were mentioning with the blue crab, that then you have the fishery, but you go ahead. Well, th th this is the problem. It's a complicated one. I mean, as a marine biologist, it's pretty simple to my, my mind that you don't want the Mediterranean to change radically and biologically by invasive species. And you don't want to encourage the stocks of invasive species because it causes environmental damage. But that's kind of a simplistic scientific point of view because then you get economists, <laughs> economists thinking, well, we could use this as a resource, okay? And other people saying, well, every organism is a God's creature. And why should some people decide we need to kill it in one place and not another, you know? So it's, it goes beyond um, simple science. It goes into ethics. It goes into economics. And... I must admit, I, I, I just focus on the biology, right? And for me, it's going to be impossible to clear out the Mediterranean of lionfish now. We hoped at the beginning in 2017 that we might be able to kill them enough quickly to reduce their reproduction. Now that we call it the cat is out of the bag. There's no way that we can control this organism. So now we just have to cope with it. Um, but I don't think it's a good idea to develop a fishery for it and try to fish it sustainably um, going forwards, because then there will be a, this perverse incentive to allow them to breed and allow them to reproduce and allow them to grow to bigger sizes so that they can look good on our dinner plates. Um, but it, it's so difficult because the only people that can really reduce their population 
other fishermen in the field. And so what do you do? And the, the, the example I gave, the blue crab, is this real dilemma obvious. So the country of Tunisia is poor. Its fishermen lost their um, income because of invasive crabs. The FAO thought, okay, well, how do we help them? Let's invite Korea and other countries to build processing factories to reduce the population of the crabs. But then the Koreans, they don't want to turn off that supply. The local fishermen don't want to turn off that supply. So in fact, they're now having minimum landing sizes. They're saying, put the females back if they've got babies um, and so on. They're protecting these crabs, which will not stay in Tunisia. They're going to go to Madrid, not Madrid. That would be a miracle. <laughs> maybe, maybe not Madrid. Okay, Madrid is safe. But Barcelona and, you know, Naples and everywhere else. And the Vongole fishery is, well, they're, they're very nervous. Yeah. You know, you know, because um, it's a massive um, source of income for local fishermen in Italy. And they're going like, what the hell are you doing? Encouraging this invasive species on our doorstep. Yes. yes. This is also like probably uh, relating with climate justice, right? Like maybe the North wants to invest in, in one type of solutions and the South needs to invest in a different type of solutions because the needs are going to be different because our economies are, are different. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, like in relation to like adaptation, right? You were mentioning adaptation, which was a huge topic in this COP, finally, I have to say. And it was not as huge as probably we wanted it to be, but uh, it was still a, a very important topic. Finally, adaptation is at the same level as mitigation. So in terms of adaptation, like what do you think that is going to be the, the uh, possible adaptation mechanisms for all of this conundrum of problems that we are having. Quand on parle d'adaptation et de pêche, on pense facilement à la sécurité alimentaire. C'est de toute façon un des objectifs du développement durable et un des plus importants. De même que la réduction de la pauvreté. Donc si on arrive à, à assurer la sécurité alimentaire et à réduire la pauvreté malgré le changement climatique, on aurait assuré ce qu'on appelle un développement résilient face au changement climatique. Et c'est ce que réclament en fait les pays du Sud. C'est d'arriver à prendre en compte les problèmes du, du changement climatique, mais de continuer à se développer, ne pas s'arrêter là. Very much, and also like uh, well, that's why another another big issue or another big topic in this COP was like food systems and food security because we need to be able to guarantee that absolutely everyone has food on the table independently of the economy of the country. So, and talking about that, like, and, and having like a very down to earth question, how is that going to impact when I go to the supermarket or I go to the market, <laughs> how is that going to impact the price on fish? And are we like, are we expecting this to have a high impact on, on customers? Euh, ce qu'il faudrait, c'est une collaboration entre les pays et notamment par rapport à la gestion des pêches et fixer le prix des poissons. On en, Jason l'a bien dit, c'est vraiment euh, quelque chose de très important d'avoir un prix correct sur les pêches. Donc, euh, si les poissons changent, à ce moment-là, le, les espèces qui vont être pêchées vont aussi changer. Donc, les gens vont se nourrir d'autres espèces. À ce moment-là, il faudrait que ces espèces soient mises au juste prix du marché Euh, et, et pas un prix extrêmement bas parce que c'est un pays du Sud. C'est un petit peu le même problème qui se pose avec le, le carbone, le prix du carbone en fait, qui n'est pas le même sur le marché volontaire. Quand on, il s'agit d'un pays du Nord, il, comme l'Europe, il est à 100 dollars la tonne, et les pays du Sud, euh, ils il démarrent à 5 dollars la tonne. Donc euh, il ne faudrait pas que ce soit pareil pour les poissons. Another topic for another dialogue is carbon markets. Just an idea, a suggestion. <laughs> so, uh, Jason, you mentioned something super interesting for me, which is the Suez Canal. And you mentioned, so because we were, 
we were saying, right? Like all of this, uh, like mix of crisis, this poly crisis, it's not about science exclusively, it's about politics, geopolitics, economics. So um, you were mentioning the Suez Canal as the root of the problem, but it could also be the root of the solution or what are the possible solutions that we can think about or what are the challenges in terms of managing that root of the problem that is highly political? Well, um, countries like Egypt and Spain are having to build more desalination facilities because of drought, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I guess... Barcelona is definitely going to be in a case where they have to get more fresh water from somewhere. And the product of a desalination plant is high salinity brine. Okay. Now that's what's missing all of a sudden. Suddenly brine is missing from the Suez Canal. That was doing a really good job of protecting Mediterranean fishermen, Mediterranean biodiversity from hemorrhaging. At the moment, it's hemorrhaging because that high salinity area is gone. And it would be, I think, I'm not an engineer, but I think it would be easy enough <laughs> to reinstate a high salinity region because there are vast desalination plants in the Suez region and also the neighboring areas. Mm -hmm. And it's it, we know how to pipe water. We know how to pipe gas. We know how to pipe oil. All you need is a pipe and you need a section of the canal with high salinity and that would stop the influx of more and more of these species. Now, some of them will be benign, but approximately one in 10 species, and there's already been a thousand, become invasive. Now, it's too late for lionfish, I admit, but you don't know what's coming next. You don't know what viruses, bacteria, uh, other problems could come through from one ocean to another. Unexpected interactions between um, parasites and fish, for example, could come into contact with organisms that have never seen each other for, for all of their evolution and are being thrown together because this the lack of salinity, um, high salinity in the Suez Canal. So I think I think there must be a solution. Now, I don't put the blame, get, don't get me wrong, I don't put the blame on Egypt mm -hmm. to solve this problem. It's an international issue. In Spain, you benefit from shipping through that canal. So does the UK, right? And it was put there, and it, the very reason it was built was to increase trade and help um, Europe. Okay, so I think the um, organization and the discussion and the financing of solving this problem has to be international. Yeah. There needs to be collaboration. Um, and of course, that region at the moment is very febrile. But you can't let a problem here divert you from another problem there too much because then this gets out of control. So um, yeah, that, that, that that's what I think is the best solution uh, to the problem is co collaborating and financing um, the rein you know, reinstating a high salinity part of the canal. I think that'd be relatively a cheap thing to do, considering the billions that are made from transporting all, um, ships through the canal. So I might be very naive, but this sounds very easy. So uh, what do you think that is preventing it from happening? I, th I think it, um, what's preventing it is lots of people don't care that species are moving from one ocean to another. They think, well, so what? What's the problem? Okay. So I think because it's happening under the water, people are, are kind of unaware that it's causing such radical changes to the mm -hmm. sea. The fishermen know it's happening because they can't catch what they used to catch. They're having to work out what the hell to do with these weird and wonderful fish they've never seen before. Right. Some of them, by the way, which are toxic to eat. Yeah. Okay. They're poisonous. So, um, they're not all delicious like the lionfish, but fortunately some are. Um, but the point, I, I think I think the main reason why it hasn't happened so far is there's a denial that there's a problem in the first place because almost always the authorities like the United Nations say, well, once an invasive species has arrived in the sea, there's nothing you can do about it, okay? But you can stop it happening in the first place, okay? So that's my argument. So once they're here, yes, I agree, it's almost impossible to, to kill them and deal with their population increase. But you can turn off the tap, which is the supply in the first mm -hmm. place. And I think that's what that's where focus needs to go. So Natalie, do you think like Jason that like some people just don't care? <laughs> and like if because it might be, it might be that some people uh that that's your impression as well. 
Euh, je, pense, je pense que les populations les plus inquiètes, ce sont effectivement les pêcheurs et les consommateurs de ces poissons qui, qui voient l'évolution de la mer et ce qui se passe en dessous. Avec les régimes alimentaires actuels où on va de plus en plus vers des protéines venues de la mer et de moins en moins de protéines terrestres, euh, de plus en plus de gens vont s'intéresser à ce qui se passe au fond de la mer et ils veulent quand même des poissons de bonne qualité. Euh, peut-être, ça je ne sais pas, peut-être que le, les écosystèmes vont au bout d'un moment euh, s'auto-réguler, comme il y a eu avec la toxifolia qui a, s'est développée énormément en Méditerranée, et puis à un moment euh, elle a reculé. Donc est-ce que, ça c'est une question que j'aimerais poser à Jason, est-ce que ça peut arriver par exemple pour les lionfish <rire> Do you, do you want to introduce the topic to them because maybe they don't know about the they call their protoxifolia issue and and you like do you want to explain to them what that is? I think he can yeah. better yeah. than me. <laughs> so I'm actually um, a phycologist, so I study algae. So that I don't mind. I can talk about this algae all <laughs> night. But one thing you need to know is it's called by the general public killer algae because um, it it kills organisms around it and. If you put it in a fish tank, there are animals that would rather starve to death than eat it because it's so toxic. Okay. Now it was um we think it came out of it was released by the aquarium in uh, Monaco, and it started to spread and it did cause an out of control problem, which has, as Natalie said, sort of balanced itself out. It it was a massive problem to start with, then the local organisms sort of learned to cope with it, and it's fitting in much better than it was in the past. But we can't rely on this happening with every organism that's come through mm -hmm. um, the Suez Canal. We don't know whether these lionfish are going to settle into the ecosystem or cause absolute havoc like they have in the, Indo uh, sorry, in the Caribbean. In the Caribbean region, they're considered to be one of the main reasons that the coral reefs are dying, because they eat the algae that would otherwise, um, if they were grazed down by... Um, Sorry, the, the lionfish eat herbivorous fish, um, which when they remove the herbivorous fish, that causes the algae to outkeep the, the coral reefs. And this is part of the reason why the Caribbean corals and the ones around the USA are dying. It's because of the lionfish. Now, this is an experiment we shouldn't really be trying in the Mediterranean, but it's too late. It's happening, right? Um, so back to, back to, I keep emphasizing this, but I want the audience to know that I think it's very important that we reinstate some biosecurity in the Suez Canal, because we just don't know what some of these organisms are going to do to the ecology of the Mediterranean Sea. And back to the Suez Canal as well, you were mentioning that this is, uh, is this not Egypt to fix, that this should be like an international cooperation fixing this. So you both have mentioned international cooperation multiple times as a very important ingredient in, in, the, in the solutions. So beyond international cooperation, so A, what is preventing international cooperation to act in, in these issues? And B, beyond international cooperation, what else do we need to, to like have a positive outcome, at least for the people? Euh, en tant qu'économiste, il y aurait une solution, c'est peut-être taxer tous les bateaux qui passent par là de, avec une taxe particulière pour remettre la salinité à bon niveau. Donc euh, l'Égypte taxe déjà beaucoup les, ses, enfin, les bateaux qui passent, c'est une source de revenus énorme pour elle, mais est-ce qu'il ne pourrait pas y avoir une partie euh, de taxe, soit en plus, soit euh, qui serait prise sur la taxe existante, qui partirait pour une raison écologique pour restaurer, en fait, cette salinité manquante. Si, là, ahora me estoy liando el idioma. I'm sorry, I'm using Catalan. Um, so taxes is a very interesting issue, and we usually don't talk about taxes that much, especially as a solution. And I think that uh, that's an important thing to mention. So do you want to add something, Jason, uh, about that? I don't like taxes. <laughs> who, who, who likes taxes? But I think some of the some of the um, items that come through the Suez Canal and enter into our shops are artificially too cheap, right? Some of this material that we use, we almost use it in a one-way um, 
direction. Mm -hmm. We just use it because it's cheap. Okay. And a lot of products that come, well, some of the products we make here and export and some of the products we import, they're too cheap anyway. And I think something needs to be, I don't think it'd be very expensive to put this security back in the canal, but it would cost somebody something somewhere, right? And a little, paying a little bit more for your shoes or your jeans or the things that are transported through the canal, I think is acceptable, right? Mm -hmm. um, on, on the topic of international collaboration and coordination and why hasn't it happened so far, I think, um, and it's going to be interesting because obviously UK now has voted itself out of um, the European Union, but what is difficult is the way the Mediterranean is managed is there's this block of EU countries that talk to each other quite effectively, have meetings all the time and are well coordinated. But then of course you've got horrible wars going on in the Eastern Mediterranean that are causing massive geopolitical problems. They're probably not that worried about security in the canal, right? They've got other things to worry about, like, you know, will they be alive tomorrow? And then in North Africa, you've got the fact that their fisheries are changing so quickly. Um, there's been political instability in many of those countries for a long time. And so they're probably not coordinating their concerns about biosecurity in the, in the Suez Canal. And I get it. Okay, I understand other people have got other problems to worry about, but they're taking their eye off the ball with the Suez Canal issue because we're seeing more and more of this problem happening. It's ramping up. Um, so it requires coordination, not just with North African, um, the Levantine countries and, and uh, EU countries. It's It's got to be even wider than that because the ships don't stop in the Mediterranean. They carry on into the Atlantic and trade throughout Europe. So the Germans should be interested, the British should be interested and so on. Yeah, I think that the Mediterranean is a is a difficult region to manage because of a lot of different reasons. Uh, but one of the things that keeps me um, like that I, my my hope is up when I I've been working a lot with some national governments and I and coming back from COP twenty eight, um, Nat Natalie and I were in COP twenty eight together and it's frustrating because you want this international cooperation to happen right you know that this is one of the most important ingredients when we talk about solutions and moving forward and then uh, nothing happens but then you move like step down and you go to subnational governments and it's interesting because there's a lot of climate ambition happening at that level and not only at the regional level at also at the local level and i know that subnational governments cannot fix the swiss canal because it's basically states that need to to fix it but it's interesting when you uh like move away right like see the big picture of everything that is happening and see this regional cooperation would you mention regional cooperation in your presentation and i thought that that was uh, very interesting because there's a lot of region in the world uh, a lot of regions in the world that have this same problem with lionfish so this exchange of knowledge i don't know if you have any example of that but this exchange of knowledge between um, regions is it happening for the lionfish well clearly because the um, lionfish have become invasive and caused environmental havoc in the usa the caribbean and now down into brazil we learned from them you know we had mm -hmm. lots and lots of conversations with them about what can we do to stop making the mistakes you made at the beginning and accelerate solutions to them in um in cyprus but so that worked very well, this this um, transatlantic collaboration mm -hmm. and learning from their mistakes and uh, cutting out the problems has worked very, very well. But then it, it worked well for the project, but then you zoom in on just the little island of Cyprus and there's big problems because the project was being run with the Greek part and they didn't want to collaborate with and talk to the occupied part. And so just on that tiny little island, um, the fish don't care. They can't see a barrier or a political problem. But even there, there was a lack of communication and a lack of learning, even over distances of 10 or 15 miles. Yeah. So it can work and it, it, globally, but then when you get down to uh, neighbours, it can start to fall apart. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know, Natalie, if you have any examples of like uh, cooperation like that. Also, when we talk about the, the Mediterranean basin, we are always, and we talk about cooperation, we always have this mindset of like the North helping the South, which I think that is interesting because in the climate context, the, the North is going to have the climate that the South has right now. So we can learn a lot from the South if if we listen, right? <laughs> so I don't know if you have like any anything else to, to say about that. Oui, je pense que déjà d'un point de vue scientifique, il y a une très bonne collaboration entre les pays du Nord et du Sud. Il y a beaucoup d'organismes autour de la Méditerranée qui travaillent ensemble déjà. Euh, donc, euh, il y a ce, ce lien collaboratif, pas uniquement entre les États, mais même entre les chercheurs, entre les, 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 les différentes entreprises où, où il y a déjà tout ça qui est mis en place. Euh, un autre exemple, avec Jason, nous étions en Grèce à Elafonissos euh, au mois de mai et euh, nous avons vu, a, eu le prince euh, Albert II de Monaco qui est venu pour goûter le lionfish et euh, pour la fête nationale à Monaco, donc le 19 novembre, on a préparé le lionfish à la table euh, princière. Donc euh, voilà, c'est quelque chose qui se met en place aussi. Et, et donc euh, les collaborations, c'est à tous les niveaux. Ce n'est pas uniquement au niveau des États, ça peut être au niveau des personnes, des, des chercheurs et euh, des individus. I have to say that I never tried the lionfish, but after this, I really want to. So <laughs> I'm kind of jealous that you both did and I didn't. Um, so I think that now I want to open the floor to absolutely everyone in the audience. If you have any questions for our speakers, uh, now is the time to ask your questions. Okay. I don't know if we have, do we have a mic for the audience? Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yes. We can hear you. We could repeat the question. Okay. I think this is more for the translators, of right? Course. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, my question, uh, coming back to the impacts of climate change on the fish stocks in the Mediterranean, we know that there will be more heat waves, and this will lead to uh, more mass mortality of uh, of species and on top of already uh, pre-existing problems it was overfishing uh, of some species. So I want to know what will be the impact on the stocks uh, in the Mediterranean, what uh, fish species are going to be the most impacted and uh, the impact on the, if, on the fishermen, uh, on the industry. Um, is it sustainable to be a fisherman uh, right now and in the future, if we are going to increase to uh, three degrees uh, at the end of the century, what would be of the of the job of fishermen? Who wants to take the question? Uh, I can. Uh, I can show a slide. Oh, can, we show, can we show her? PowerPoint again. Podem passar, passar el, seu, el seu PowerPoint un altre cop, oh. el de la Natalie. Hello. Ça ne pas ici, mais en fait, j'avais un petit peu anticipé la question et j'avais mis tout à la fin donc, euh, de ma présentation, voilà, j'avais mis ici les, les espèces de poissons 
qui sont plus impactés en Méditerranée. Donc parmi les poissons que nous avons étudiés, euh, nous avons pris des poissons évidemment commerciaux, comme j'avais dit. Donc vous voyez quand même euh, quels sont les poissons qui sont plus impactés et les moins impactés. Et no dans notre étude, nous avons même été plus loin. Nous avons regardé avec les différents scénarios 4.5 et euh, 8.5 euh, quelles étaient les espèces les plus euh, impactées. Donc euh, on a vu que les espèces, les espèces de Merciales, par exemple, qui ont une forte valeur, valeur économique, étaient moins impactées, alors que les, céphala les céphalopodes étaient les moins sensibles. Nous avons même placé dans les pays, si vous regardez, euh, par exemple ici, les, les, les pélagiques euh, sont, sont les plus sensibles au Liban et en Égypte, euh, voilà, donc euh, ici, vous voyez les sensibilités moins importantes en France, en Espagne et en Slovénie. Donc, euh, c'est tout dans, dans l'étude. Et, et comme ça, on peut faire des prévisions et voir quelles sont les, les, les espèces qui vont être plus impactées dans le futur, puisque là, on a vraiment pris des scénarios en utilisant les scénarios du GIEC. C'est unfortunate, parce que j'aime octopus. <laughs> Yeah. Um, do anyone, anyone uh, has any like follow-up question or do you, okay. Well, I, I would jump in. Oh, on... sorry. Yeah, I would jump yeah. in on this. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just would like to jump in and say that although we do know some species will be more vulnerable than others, um, it would be a mistake to think that we won't be fishing in the future because of climate change, right? Because you can go to other places that are warmer than here They still have fisheries, they can still feed themselves, right? It will just change, that's all. And what's required is to face a new reality that there will be different species here with different temperature tolerances. And so the fisheries and the food will change for sure. But the fishermen will have jobs, okay? They're, they'll just have to adapt and they'll have to adapt quickly. But fishermen that I know are very adaptable people, okay? So... Um, Don't worry too much that you won't have any protein from the sea in the future, but it will change what types of protein we can get. I think we can be blinded by all of this talk of climate change as and, and take and, and that stops us managing our fisheries properly because at the moment the Mediterranean is unquestionably mismanaged, overfished, and has got a very low um, amount of top quality big organisms because of overexploitation. That is needs to be addressed. I think people have talked about it for since Jacques Cousteau was making his films. Okay, that needs to be addressed. Um, you're not going to get big fish populations and big amounts of food on the table if you keep over exploiting. You can. It's possible despite climate change if the fisheries are managed well. Je peux rajouter aussi que une des solutions serait l'aquaculture, mais une aquaculture soutenable. Donc à ce moment-là, les pêcheurs changeraient de métier, iront plus vers l'aquaculture plutôt que d'être de simples pêcheurs et capturer les poissons. We actually didn't talk that much about aquaculture, so it's it's interesting that you that you mentioned that because it could be part of the solution, and and it's it's something that we're already used to. So um and i don't know if you want to add something else since we didn't really touch the topic that much on aqua l'aquaculture on sait déjà qu'elle est très importante en égypte maintenant il faut la rendre un peu plus soutenable parce qu'elle est pas elle n'est pas assez malheureusement mais euh, elle existe déjà euh, en turquie aussi ils sont en train de la développer donc je pense que ça fait partie des solutions à mettre en place. Donc le métier du pêcheur, du pêcheur va un petit peu changer, va s'adapter, on va dire. I think that we had another question, right? Yeah. Professor Jason, thank you very much for your speech of your comments. I would like to ask you a question. Uh, could we be able to manage? Could, could be we be able to manage uh, well-managed fisheries in order to avoid the illegal immigrants coming from North Africa or maybe Senegal? 
can be a way to manage the fisheries from the origin countries. I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question properly, but are you saying fishing could be a way of managing invasive species? Yeah. No? Migration yeah. from people from the south of the Mediterranean to the north, that maybe if we manage the fisheries in a, in a more sustainable way, I, that's what I'm understanding, yeah. then we are preventing people looking for a better life to like come to the north because they are going to have a better life in their countries. Is that what you would... Okay. I think, um, I mean, it's, it's on the news all the time in the UK, I, I'm, I'm aware that the problem is more severe in Spain and in France and so on, but we're kind of obsessed with immigration in the UK. And I think it's always going to happen when there is inequality and where there's some people that have a lot and some people that don't, and when there's wars. And so you're right, absolutely. If you can rebuild the economy and the stocks of and the situation in the countries that people are fleeing from, then they won't want to flee in the first place. Right. If if you manage their um, if they they are able to manage their resources properly, then they will have no reason to want to try to escape. Right. So part of part of what we should do as marine scientists is help them adapt their situation to rebuild their stocks. But the choices aren't clear. They're not. They're not. You must do this or you must do that. They have. It has to be done in collaboration with the economists, with the um, the fisheries scientists, and so on. Um, but I think I think you've. You've made a good point that if the situation was good in their countries in the first place, then we wouldn't have this immigration problem. Thank you very much. Do okay. you want to add something about that? Uh, sur la migration des populations, uh, uh, je, je pense que la raison principale de la migration des populations pour l'instant est plus politique que vraiment environnementale même si on étudie beaucoup la migration environnementale et la cause du changement climatique, euh, la raison euh, est plus politique et économique, je pense. Euh, voilà. je, je suis moi-même venue d'un pays du Sud pour aller dans le Nord et euh, je ne crois pas avoir porté tort à qui que ce soit, au contraire. Donc euh, je ne suis pas personnellement contre cette migration si elle est raisonnable et contrôlée. I think that you mentioned something interesting uh, because this links with climate justice, right? And I and and there's a lot of studies now that are linking an increase of the migration with climate change. And I, some people are against the term uh, climate um, migrants. And I don't remember what was the other word that they were using. But I think that it's, I, I agree with both of you on like by fixing this, we're not going to fix this issue because it's bigger than just than just fisheries, but it could be a starting point. I don't know if someone else from the audience. Okay. I actually have three questions oh, wow. um, for Jason, but if there's other people that <laughs> can ask one and then we can we can see <laughs> if uh, if there's time. So um so yeah I was surprised to hear that that you think that we cannot get rid of the lionfish at the moment. Um and I was wondering because unfortunately we got rid of other species mm -hmm. because of overfishing, right? And and it seems counterintuitive to think that we we couldn't do overfishing um, with an invasive one. Um, but I was wondering, without without needing to target uh, overfishing, if we are fishing a lot more uh, the lionfish for X amount of years, would that give other species that have been depleted a chance to bounce back? or not like um and and i'm thinking of some commercial uses of uh some fish maybe not only for human consumption but i'm thinking pet food for example that uses a lot of fish especially for cats if we stop fishing certain species will that give those um, depleted fisheries any chance and 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 at the same time help us fight the lion fish yeah well thanks for the question the the the, the fish that gets put into cat food is usually um, has a low price, low value generally, or maybe it's not been treated well, so it's, you can't do much else with it. And so its value is low. And the, the types of fish that usually have low value are ones that you can catch easily. 
The trouble with lionfish is they're quite difficult to catch. Um, as an individual with a pole, they're easy. But actually, it takes a lot of people with poles to catch them. And we don't know how to catch them with the pots yet. That hasn't been tried, but we've, our small attempts were failures. So the only way we can expect to catch these lionfish is if we get a good price for them. They're not going to become cat food because you're going to need so much manpower to, to, to get them. And they live in areas like rocky reef areas, and they tend to like to live on overhangs and places that are a little bit difficult to fish, that you can't trawl them. You can't use a net that you drag through the water to catch them. So you, those types of fish, they end up in cat food. But this is a special fish that is difficult really to catch and it lives in special places. So I really don't think we're going to be able to overfish it to the extent that you can with trawl fisheries. You know, the monkfish that was a picture of a monkfish earlier, that's a, a trawl fish species. And that is easily uh, reduced in its stocks because um, we've done it, <laughs> we know. Now, I don't want to be pessimistic. Maybe if lots of countries all decide, okay, we're going to let people go hell for leather and catch as many lionfish as you can, um, that I, it might work. I don't think it will. I think what's going to have to happen instead is there's targeted removals from some special places that you consider to be very important from a marine conservation or a marine protection point of view. Maybe you've got an area that you know native grouper congregate um, and have juveniles. That's a place you probably don't want lionfish, so you might put extra effort into catching them from that location. I don't think you're gonna I, I don't think you're gonna be able to remove them from everywhere. Uh, it's gonna have to be targeted, unfortunately. Thank you. You have two more questions. That right? actually got rid of one of the questions, okay. <laughs> which was more working with the private sector and, and food companies and so on. But I understand, yeah, the, the difficulty. The other one is around the Suez Canal. Um, what can we do? So I didn't know that. And and I think that your your idea, and probably there's many more scientists with like brilliant ideas that make sense. Um, what can the citizens do, if anything? Like it, it, it is a problem that feels so far away from our area of influence. But once you know, um, kind of the natural question is, okay, okay no, how do we get involved? How can we say this matters to, to us? I, I don't know, honestly. I've been shouting about this for about one year now. And I've told the EU ministers, I've told um, my local politicians, they think, well, this is a problem for someone else. And it seems like everybody thinks it's a problem for someone else. And I don't know how to spark the action that's needed. I thought maybe the United Nations would be the best avenue to go through, but I worked with the United Nations office that's based in Tunisia, SPARAC it's called, it's, it's to do with the management of invasive species. They won't even use the term Suez Canal and invasion in the same sentence. Politically, they won't admit it's a problem. So if the United Nations based in North Africa can't deal with it, I don't know who can. So I'm all ears to the room if anyone else has got ideas. Do you have Thank any you. ideas, Natalie? <laughs> <laughs> I put you on the spot. If you, if you don't have any, it's okay. Je n'ai pas de solution économique, mais d'un point de vue politique, mais je pense que de toute façon, le, le canal de Suez a quand même, comme l'a dit si bien Jason, euh, évité beaucoup d'émissions de CO2, parce qu'au lieu que les bateaux fassent un grand tour et contournent l'Afrique, il passe par ce canal, donc l'élargissement était quand même assez intéressant de ce point de vue, donc on a gagné en tant qu'émission de CO2. Est-ce qu'on pourrait pas, à ce moment-là, maintenant, comme tous les pays doivent être net zéro, est-ce qu'on pourrait pas utiliser euh, cet euh, cette argent qu'on aurait mis au lieu de compenser les émissions de CO2 à essayer d'investir pour trouver une solution au, au problème qui vient du, du, de, de ce canal de Suez So I think that we have time for just one more question, if there is one more question in the audience. La vols dir en català i jo tradueixo? O, o en quin idioma la vols dir? We could like um, change the way uh, boats are made. 
to, um, to prevent this kind of uh, migration of invasive species or it's like impossible because it's cheaper um, to build them the way they are built and not invest in um, amigo, um, <laughs> improving your installations. So um, the problem is investing in me. Could the solution be investing in um, improving the installations of boats so that there is no migration of invasive species in the first place? Or it's like... Okay. So, um, thanks for the question. The um, one of the one of the blue crab species I mentioned did come through into the Mediterranean in ships, and the reason it did that was a poor um, treatment of the ballast water that keeps the ship stable. Um, now, the United Nations um, International Maritime Office has got agreement from countries all around the world to treat the ballast water before it's released into the coastline, for example, off Barcelona. So that's a big advance. There is improved ballast water treatment. But the problem is the, the, the lionfish, for example, didn't come through on a ship. It just came through as larvae through the canal. Not to nothing to do with the ships. So maybe I didn't explain it clearly enough, but the, the migration of organisms through that canal, a lot of it has got nothing to do with the ships. It's just in the water. And so you can't change the, if no matter how much you improve the uh, cleaning of the ships or put special paint on the bottom of the ship to stop biofouling, that's not going to solve the problem because the organisms are moving in the water, not in the ships. No, I thought about the algae that actually, that uh, right now they are like invading the coast of Spain from the south, from Cadiz. And like this came from from the, the tarifa, and they, see they are coming um, up, and because I studied them, and like I thought about this kind of problem of in the boat. Um, but even if you uh, restore the salinity in the canal, it won't solve the problem because they are like um, making this. Um, more um, fondo, more profound, more deep, deeper. more deep. They're making it deeper, so the salinity won't stay the same in the place because there's like this in exchange of waters. So we should or stop the like trade through the canal or build it from um, down downside from it. No. I'm not an engineer, but I think because of the desalination infrastructure, there's enough high salinity water to put it in the canal. And you're absolutely right. It's because it's deeper and wider. You need to put a lot in, right, to raise the salinity. But if you did it over a stretch, then that should be a solution to block the movement of these organisms, I think. Um, but that's an engineer, that's a question for engineers, <laughs> not me, but I'd like to talk to you about it afterwards. Yeah. So um, just to wrap up everything, I think that we've been talking about uh, the how the interlinked not only crisis like the biodiversity loss, the climate change, but also uh, the social aspects and the climate justice and also the interlinked solutions, right? Because like one solution is not only about uh, science or technology, there's also economic aspects. And I think that uh, I uh, this is very clear from both your presentations and all your answers. I also think that there are solutions it's challenging, but they are there and we just need to keep working on them. And on that note, I want to ask you just for like to end this session, why are you optimistic? And, or is like, is there something that makes you optimistic about what you do? I think the two problems that we have Jason and I, 
euh, sont liés en fait. Moi j'ai parlé de la migration de, des poissons, leur distribution qui allait changer dans la Méditerranée, puisque les poissons vont remonter dans le nord avec le réchauffement climatique. Et Jason a parlé d'invasion de, des, des espèces nouvelles qui en fait prolifèrent à cause de ce changement climatique. Il y a une tropicalisation de la Méditerranée qui se fait avec ces poissons qui du coup trouvent un climat qui est aussi bon que la mer Rouge et qui se, se multiplie tranquillement en Méditerranée. Alors, est-ce que je suis optimiste euh, On sort de la COP28, euh, il y a quand même un accord de sortir des énergies fossiles qui a été signé. Maintenant, entre la signature et euh, l'action euh, réelle mm -hmm. sur le terrain, on sait qu'il y a un pas, mais on peut toujours espérer à la sortie de cette COP que voilà, on va dans la bonne direction. Transitioning away. <rire> <laughs> What makes you optimistic, Jason? Well, on, on the COP um, uh, topic, I went to the, the COP26 in Glasgow and I, was, I came away quite disappointed about the amount of influence that the petrochemical and oil and gas industries have on um, trying to create an appetite for us to carry on burning CO2 and saying that they will come up with solutions that will fix the problem in the future and that they can continue picking up this oil and burning it. But on the optimistic point, the fact that the eyes of the world are on the Gulf states where this oil is being produced means that most, peop most people aren't stupid, right? So I teach students at university. They pretty much all know that we need to reduce CO2 emissions and reduce Uh, our reliance on hydrocarbons. They're the future. They're students. They give me optimism because they get it. They don't mind what the media is talking about. Yeah. They understand that it, the, the Gulf states are worried. They can't sell their oil because they want more and more renewable energy. And that, of course, I'm optimistic. I took the train from Madrid to Barcelona yesterday. I saw lots of wind farms everywhere. That is obviously a good route into the future. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, both of you, for this like amazing perspective on the topic, all your knowledge, your time, and also for sharing your hope for optimism. And now I'm going to give the floor to um, Mr. Ja uh, Jaume Lanaspa for the final closure, right? Muchas gracias. Bueno, eh, perdón, muchas gracias. De hecho, ha eh, sido una sesión de estas la que uno piensa que sería eh, un placer poder seguir un rato más profundizando, aprendiendo, etc. Y luego, razonando por, por analogía, en un momento que se me ha ocurrido una idea, una idea irreverente, que es que a veces tenemos tanto miedo la migración humana como la migración eh, de, de los peces en el Mediterráneo. Entonces, mire, eh, la migración humana no es como los peces león, no hay ningún problema con que migremos de un lado a otro en el Mediterráneo y, y, en, y en el resto del mundo, porque la humanidad lleva algo así como 10.000 años, como, como mínimo, emigrando de unos lugares a otros y se ha adaptado perfectamente en todas partes. Entonces, perdón, esta pequeña observación, en todo caso, lo que es muy estimulante es saber que frente a los riesgos y los problemas que se van produciendo, también hay muchas maneras de poder mitigarlos y poder adaptarlos, aunque alguna vez la lentitud con que se adoptan las soluciones puede ser un poco desesperante. Pero bueno, viéndolo con cierta perspectiva histórica, creo que hay elementos suficientes como para mantener el optimismo y la esperanza. Y muchas gracias de nuevo a, a todos ustedes. Thank you. Thank you. That was really, yeah, I, I loved it. Yeah. So another speech we have not we have not finished yet. Uh, in todo caso, muchísimas muchísimas gracias uh, a los convidados de hoy, a toda la moderadora. Um, Alicia y a la doctora Hilmi, al, al doctor Hall Spencer. 
Unes breus paraules abans de cedir el testimoni final al director del Consell Assessor del Desenvolupament Sostenible de Catalunya, que avui ens té l'honor que ens acompanyi, el senyor Arnau Caral, simplement en nom de l'Institut d'Europa de la Mediterrània, atès que avui clausurem aquest cicle de Met Dialogues 2030, la tercera edició, que hem organitzat, coorganitzat conjuntament amb el Club de Roma i amb la Fundació La Caixa, doncs agrair, òbviament, la magnífica disposició dels espais, del Caixa Fòrum Macaia, l'enderesa i la simpatia i la cordialitat que sempre podem treballar amb el Jaume i el seu equip, i òbviament agrair a l'equip de l'IEMET, comandat per l'Antoine Abriugal, que abans ha fet una... plantejat una pregunta molt interessant als ponents. I, a més, estem contents perquè cluem aquest tercer cicle dels Met Dialogues. El mateix dia ara es deia que la COP28 ha anunciat que finalment han arribat a un acord. No sabem quan les energies fòssils acabaran, Sabem que els acords de les COPs, i això em sembla que la doctora Hilmi en feia menció, no són vinculants, per tant no tenen els estats, no tenen l'obligació d'implementar-los, no hi ha un calendari, però tenim un acord i això s'ha de posar en valor de 200 països i, vaja, òbviament les institucions que estem aquí representades ens continuarem fent la nostra feina, la nostra tasca. Aquest cicle anava sobre les mesures o les polítiques d'adaptació al Mediterrani perquè és, en definitiva, la gran assignatura pendent i jo crec que al llarg d'aquestes sis sessions, parlant sobre l'impacte de l'augment de les temperatures, parlant sobre l'impacte a les zones costeres, sobre l'impacte a les ciutats, a l'agricultura, avui a la pesca, hem pogut veure, analitzar amb ponents, tots ells, de gran renom, amb un equilibri de gènere exemplar en aquesta edició, que per nosaltres això també és un element molt important. Hem pogut analitzar com els diferents països riberencs de la Mediterrània s'adapten al canvi climàtic i aquí estem. I com que malgrat que avui estem contents perquè hi ha aquest acord de la COP28 doncs sabem que demà continuarem patint malauradament els estralls i els efectes del canvi climàtic, doncs a la propera edició dels Met Dialogues l'any vinent, no? Esperem que a mitjans, a partir de mitjans de l'any vinent, doncs podrem analitzar l'impacte del canvi climàtic i els avenços en la sostenibilitat des d'un altre angle. Per tant, moltíssimes gràcies per la seva assistència i ara sí, té la paraula final el director del CATS. Moltes gràcies. Bona tarda. La traducció simultània en català funciona? Sí, eh? Funcionava, eh? Sí. Doncs això, bona tarda, seré breu, perquè crec que tothom està marxant, diguem-ne. Per mi és un honor, diguem-ne, com a director del Consell Assessor del Govern per als temes de sostenibilitat, poder parlar sobre el mar. Bàsicament, el mar és el gran desconegut, és una capa d'aigua fantàstica que mirem des de la platja i desconeixem, bàsicament, la major part de mortals, desconeixem pràcticament tot el que passa a sota. I no entenem que el mar és responsable de moltes de les coses, del nostre benestar, en bona part, i la regulació climàtica depèn de la mar. I dic ara passo el femení de la mar perquè hi ha una... La nostra exvicepresidenta, la doctora Josefina Castellví, la doctora Castellví va ser una gran oceanògrafa catalana, i a mi em va explicar que quan parlava la gent que estima el mar, em parla en femení, la mar. Llavors, em va explicar també aquest element, que desconeixem tot el que està passant a sota. I, per tant, com que ho desconeixem, ni ho estimem, ni ho valorem i no som capaços de reaccionar. I que segurament moltes de les coses que estem veient avui van per aquí també, perquè no entenem què està passant. I ens importa molt poc. Ens importa molt poc perquè ho desconeixem, quan ens hauríem d'importar. Per tant, aquest primer punt és important, la celebració que parlem sobre la mar, 
avui amb un acte sobre adaptació a canvi climàtic. L'altre és aquest element. Es parla molt de mitigació, estem poc, estem reduint les emissions de casos de fer hivernacle, però estem anant molt més lentament de què toca i estem també anys llum de l'adaptació. Som molt conscients dels dos factors, però en canvi anem massa a poc a poc. Anem massa a poc a poc. I el poc que fem en temes d'adaptació és el que l'IPCC, el grup d'experts en canvi climàtic, va publicar en el seu sisè informe que deia de la mala adaptació. O sigui, hem fet poc, hem anat posant... No hem tingut la fotografia completa i hem anat fent petites cosetes i ens hi ha un tsunami de canvis. Llavors, a vegades, i tornant a la imatge matinera, estem anant amb una barca, estem intentant tapar vies d'aigua, però ens ve una dada per sobre que encara no estem veient o que no som capaços de veure. I això és el que s'està passant en temes d'adaptació. Els canvis que s'estan produint en tots els sectors són molt més ràpids, són més profunds, de més magnitud, i van a un ritme cada cop més ràpid de què ens pensàvem. Hi ha molts casos, hi ha efectes que es sumen, i a sobre petits factors, quan sumen, donen a canvis molt més profunds i que realment cal posar-se molt seriosos, es pactaran a la vida de les actuals generacions i de les futures a tot arreu del món. I aquí també hi ha un element d'aquells de perdre aquesta visió occidental de dir aquí no es passarà res perquè serem capaços d'adaptar-nos. Primera, que és mentida perquè ens passarà factura. Ja ens està passant factura i estem veient aquests dies la sequera. Però és que a part, també des del punt de vista de justícia social, en els països, diguem-ne, rics, tenim grans àmplies parts de la nostra població que no té la capacitat, no té els mitjans d'adaptar-se com tenen altres. I, per tant, viuran de forma molt més cruenta alguns d'aquests impactes. Per tant, el canvi climàtic ens afecta i ens afectarà a tots, però especialment a aquelles persones més vulnerables i en els països més vulnerables. I, per tant, aquí en tenim molt clar que ens estem jugant. I hem d'entendre que el món canvia i que és molt difícil explicar a la gent que el món canvia. I que la imatge que tenim fixada mentalment del món actual no serà... Si costa molt de canviar. I, per tant, que l'adaptació és molt profunda. És deixar de poder fer coses i de deixar hàbits i de deixar imatges que teníem idealitzades com a societat. I això implica una adaptació mental. Per tant, és l'adaptació davant de l'economia i dels temes més estructurals de la nostra societat, però sobretot depèn d'un canvi mental. I això és la part segurament més difícil de fer. I això ens està passant en molts temes. Més temes que lliguen. Avui parlàvem molt de la COP. Jo crec que no sé si, Roger, has tingut algun element, has provocat que la COP es posposés un dia perquè coincidís amb l'acte. Entenc que sí, i t'agraeixo. Però realment el que ens ha passat a la COP, segurament la part més positiva, la part optimista, és que hi ha acord. Si no hi hagués hagut acord a Dubai, hi hagués hagut un problema. Però sota aquesta paraula, sota aquesta frase, són 196... Són 190 estats que han signat aquest document, que són 196 punts, són 196 articles. On la part en la qual ens agafem és que deixem enrere els combustibles fòssils. Però perquè he llegit així molt ràpidament, es fa molta referència al carbó, es fa molt poca referència al petroli. I aquest és un element... I, a part, el que ens trobem és que van sortint altres energies de transició, combustibles de transició, vull dir que no és tot... No hem de sortir d'aquí, no hem de sortir d'aquí anant a buscar ampolles de cava i fer una festa per celebrar el que s'ha acordat avui. Vull dir, hi ha molt marge encara de millora. I aquí hi ha un altre element. Passen coses a la COP. Avui a la COP ha passat hi ha la signatura, durant aquests dies hi ha hagut acords importants, hem posat l'alimentació, hem posat la salut, per primera vegada en una cop s'ha parlat de salut i els efectes de la salut, de canvi climàtic sobre la salut, i això és molt important, però més enllà del que passa a la COP hi ha molta feina per fer, fora de la COP, a nivell dels estats, 
a nivell europeu, a nivell dels estats, a nivell de les regions i a nivell local. Moltes vegades tenim aquesta tendència a pensar no, en què passa la COP. O sigui, és com un blanc i negre. No? Si, no passa, si la COP no hi ha acords, en bons enfonts, quan la major part de les emissions les estem produint nosaltres amb el nostre dia a dia. Per tant, quan analitzeu aquest impacte de la COP és una valoració positiva perquè hi ha acord, molts llums i ombres, però malgrat tot la feina passa, comença per Barcelona i comença per Catalunya i comença per... Llavors, això, sí, això sí és important tenir-ho en compte. Com que no començo a comunicar eh, impresentable, començat sense agrair, sense agrair a les institucions organitzadores, a doncs, l'IEMET i, el, i l'oficina del Club de Roma Barcelona per la invitació. Però volia fer mica aposta. És a dir, per mi eh, aquesta invitació és important perquè, bàsicament, ja fa quan estem col·laborant amb aquests diàlegs eh, pel 2030, i bàsicament amb el CATS, però també el MEDEC, que és el grup d'experts en canvi climàtic a la Mediterrània, han estat convidats cada, vegada, cada any a assistir-hi. Sigui a través meu o sigui, per exemple, aquest any hi havia molts dels, dels ponents eren membres d'aquesta plataforma, que és el MEDEC. Bàsicament, què estem intentant fer nosaltres amb el MEDEC i amb el CATS? Intentar que la ciència, que el coneixement científic, arribi a taula de les persones que han de prendre decisions. Tenim milers d'informes científics publicats, ens falta acció. Val? Per tant, actes com els que estem fent avui, l'únic que estem intentant fer també és posar aquest coneixement científic sobre la taula de les persones que han de prendre decisions, que no són només els polítics, sinó també que són vostès, com a, com a, com a persones que voten, que consumeixen i que, per tant, decideixen. Val? Fan política en aquest sentit. Llavors, per tant, l'agraïment en aquest sentit i l'agraïment en el sentit de promoure la implicació de tot, la, la consciència, la informació i, per tant, fomentar la consciència per passar a l'acció. I això, i això és important. Només un parell de coses que fan referència a, a Catalunya, que crec que pot ser interessant, i una que fa referència al MEDEC. Començo per aquesta última. El MEDEC, que és el grup d'experts en canvi climàtic de la Mediterrània, que agrupa en aquests moments 700 científics i científiques, és un panel obert, que dona, i el CATS me aconsella el suport, però també dona suport a la Unió pel Mediterrani, dona suport al Plan Ble, al govern del Principat de Mònaco, al govern de França. Està a punt de publicar tres informes eh, durant aquest 2020, el proper 2024, un que fa referència als impactes de canvi climàtic sobre la costa, o sigui, els riscos costaners associats al canvi climàtic. Un altre, molt important també, sobre eh, el nexe, la vinculació entre canvi climàtic, alimentació, energia i biodiversitat, que és un tema central, i especialment la Mediterrània. I, finalment, un altre que lliga amb el que hem comentat abans, s'ha comentat sobre canvi climàtic, seguretat humana, seguretat humana i migracions. Especialment, amb, i aquí posem, tinguem clar que vivim en una Europa que està bloquejat i que s'està bloquejant davant de qualsevol entrada i que, per tant, som els prínci- tenim molt a pensar, molt a pensar, a reflexionar sobre què farem quan aquestes migracions o mobilitat, o mobilitat humana es produeixi per causes climàtiques. I aquest és un tema que ens ha de preocupar. I com a, com a, com a Catalunya, hi ha un element que, que ens interessa explicar. És, uh, l'any passat es va aprovar una estratègia d'adaptació al canvi climàtic. El govern de Catalunya va aprovar una estratègia d'adaptació al canvi climàtic. És la segona versió. És, o sigui, ja en portem dues. Us convido, us convido a accedir a mirar-la. Eh, és una estratègia de passió canvi climàtic que ens afecta a tots, no és només pel govern, que ens afecta a tots, però que una mica està pensant eh, escenaris de passió futura eh, molt profunda. És a dir, I aquí implica l'adaptació en tots els sectors. Finalment, un altre punt que, que volia comentar és que precisament la COP es va, es va presentar una primera aliança, una aliança de governs, de 14 governs regionals de de regions de clima mediterrani, per tant, que compartim tota una sèrie de problemàtiques, de, 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 no, de, de, de qüestions ambientals, no hi ha problemes, eh, qüestions ambientals, i que, per tant, ens, ens hem decidit posar-nos d'acord per aprendre, per compartir i per aprendre què hem de fer en matèria d'incendis forestals, en matèria de la gestió adaptativa dels espais naturals. Val? Per tant, és un punt en el qual 14 regions on hi ha Catalunya, on hi ha Califòrnia, on hi ha la Baixa Califòrnia i Mèxic, on hi ha eh, Nova Gales del Sud, etc., estan treballant no, per adaptar-nos conjuntament, aprendre, no, pensar, aprendre els altres i pensar col·lectivament per avançar en l'adaptació 
davant del canvi climàtic, que com a regions mediterrànies ens afectaran molt més que altres, que altres espais. I si voleu ja en deixeu l'últim punt, que torna a la mar, hem començat pel mar i torna al mar, però també és important que ho conegueu, vosaltres i també els, 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 els convidats, um, des de fa uns quants, ja fa uns parell d'anys o tres anys, des de la Catalunya s'ha començat amb un procés de cogestió, eh, cogestió marítima, cogestió pesquera primer, per també començar a treballar des de l'administració amb el món científic i amb els pescadors per intentar veure com podíem treballar plegats per gestionar millor les, eh, els estocs de pesca. Vam començar primer amb el Sonso i anat avançant. I és interessant, és a dir, no és l'administració que regula perquè sí, no és el... el el, no estableix veres perquè sí, sinó que és el propi món pesquer que, amb el coneixement que li porten els científics, pren col·lectivament amb l'administració decisions sobre el futur de la pesca. I això ha generat que en, algunes, en alguns casos s'hagin regenerat alguns estocs, algunes zones que s'havien perdut. I això és accés a l'àmbit de la gestió marítima, cogestió marítima. Per tant, ja és no és només la pesca, sinó que és com, a partir del diàleg entre la ciència el món científic i les administracions, no només el govern de Catalunya, sinó també el món local, podem començar a repensar el mar. I, i sobretot, a repensar com gestionem aquesta mar. I de la mar a mar, eh, hi ha molts mars, hi ha molts, i jo sempre faig la broma que és una mar de canvis, és a dir, al mar hi ha molts canvis i cal fer molts canvis per poder gestionar-lo, ho deixaria aquí perquè crec que hi ha el risc que comenci a parlar, a parlar, a parlar, i no sortim d'aquí fins a les 9. Ho podríem fer, però crec que no és, no és sostenible, perquè el, el temps sabeu que el recurs és un recurs finit i no renovable. Dit això, bon Nadal.